I was on uh, Twitter. Um, I don't know how I ended up on Twitter, but I was on Twitter one day, and I saw someone tweet this. They said, I believe that abortion is morally wrong. And someone replied, you hate women. And then I saw someone say, I don't believe that you or the government or someone else should control what I do with my body. And someone replied, you're a murderer. And I thought to myself, this is a hot topic. <laughs> this, is, this is incredibly um, um, uh, difficult language. Um, political left or political right? Pro-abortion versus pro-life. Uh, right to choose versus right to life. And then I mention this, that in the harshest rhetoric, it's anti-choice, anti-women versus pro-baby killing. So those, that rhetoric doesn't help us have um, persuasive dialogue. That, uh, that doesn't help us really get to the main idea of what um, we're trying to express as a church family or as people who belong to God. There was a time where we thought that science would solve this for us. Do you know that? There was, there was a period of time where we thought if we just get to the bottom of the science, we could solve the abortion conflict. All we needed to do was just kind of reveal to people the science of when life began. But um, the science isn't really disputed anymore. It's not really a science or spiritual theology challenge anymore um, because the facts aren't really disputed that at conception um, there is new DNA strand, that there is a distinct life that is unique from the mother or father, that there is a new life that has been formed. At eight weeks, the science tells us that a fetus can respond to pain. All of the organs needed for life in the future, in the weeks to come, are already there. Um, and yet, legally, you can end that life, but if somebody uh, ends that life through a vehicular manslaughter, homicide charge, that person can be charged with a crime. So, it's complicated legally, but we'll, we, we've noticed that science really hasn't solved anything. Science hasn't helped us move towards any real solution. And my um, position is that it's because it's not a scientific issue. It's really a spiritual moral question. It's a spiritual moral issue that has to be investigated spiritually and morally. So um, when we're looking at the main idea, we have to ask the question, what do I... Or what do we, as uh, people who belong to God here at the North Central Church family, believe about the abortion issue? Well, I believe that it's way beyond a political policy issue. It's way above that. It's not below that. It's not under a political policy topic. It's actually above that. It's more important than politics. It's more important than what position or policy or what politician that we're voting for. It's above that. It's bigger. It's, a, it's an issue in the heart of the Father who created us. That's what I believe. So how would, we, how would we explain that? Basically, we explain it this way, that from our position, church family, church leaders, from conception to the grave, all life is precious. Why? Why is all life precious? Because God made every single life in his own image. He is the creator of life, and um, what we call that is the sanctity of every life. That's why that phrase is used. It's not a logo, slogan, motto that shows up on bumper stickers and T-shirts and the sides of uh, New Hope transportation vehicles. Every single life is made in His image, and that makes life sanctified, or the sanctity of life. And that's where that phrase comes from. There are some, there's a couple of P words I want to kind of run out here in front of you today to help you get a grasp of this real quick. The sanctity of life has a couple of P's that have emerged as the main um, focus points here in this particular moral topic. Um, these are competing P words. These are uh, contrasting P words. And we're going to start with this word personhood. Personhood. We don't hear a lot. I mean, if you follow political campaigns, if you still follow politics, 
you'll notice that when you're getting to this topic, it gets pretty uh, harsh, it gets pretty cutthroat, but I don't know that we hear this word a lot, and it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate because this is a vital P word in the topic, and the P word is personhood. What does that mean? It's when the soul begins. Not just when the scientific, biological life begins, but also, and more importantly, when the soul begins. And fundamentally, personhood, right, a a, a little um, fetus becomes a person. It's a spiritual reality. Um, And it's generated by the presence of the image of God in every life. Let me say that again. It's It's fundamentally, it's a spiritual reality of the presence of God in every single life. The presence of the image of God in every single life. So that's what we mean when we say person. So there's a new question. And the vital question is no longer when does life begin. The new vital question is when does the soul arrive? When is that soul Um, kind of emerge in that biological life. And this question really isn't scientific. It's not a science question. It's fundamentally spiritual and it's fundamentally moral. So how should, here's the question that I think it's worth asking, how should disciples of Jesus view the sanctity of life and love our neighbor, right? And also love the unborn in a way that honors God's brilliant, infinite, beautiful design or his own creation. So as Christians here in our North Central Church family, we believe that every human life matters infinitely to the Lord. Every human life, born, unborn. Theologically and biblically, we believe that life begins at conception. And Psalm 139, if you get a chance to read through Psalm 139, it really does a thorough, comprehensive treatment of life beginning, the soul emerging in the little, uh, um, the little life there that has begun. And it is the premier text describing the sanctity of life. And David, who wrote the psalm, is praising God for the creation of life in the mother's womb. Check this out. Here's some summary ideas that emerge right out of this text regarding the sanctity of life in Psalm 139. Here we go. We, humans, are created in God's image and foreknown. This comes up and comes out in the Scripture, Psalm 139. We are knit together in the mother's womb. And by the way, a knitter, somebody, where are my knitters? I was prompted, where are my knitters? There's one? Come on, knitters. Come on, knitters. Two, any more knitters? Three, any retired knitters? Your hands are like, stop it. Stop it right now. There's retired knitters everywhere. And all of them raise their hand like this. They're like, yeah, I I can't do it anymore. (laughs) I quit knitting the day arthritis arrived. No more for me. So listen, the reason I bring up knitting is this, because when knitting is happening, there is an intentional, loving, caregiving, precise knitter that is behind the scenes doing the work. And this word knit means there's a knitter. There's some active, engaged um, uh, process of creating that's going on from the knitter. Then we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully means reverent, in in adoration of a creator. And then his eyes saw our unformed substance. Some in this debate would say unformed, probably not the right word. They might say on the other side of the argument, they might say it's just tissue, it's just biological matter. But God's eyes saw that unformed substance made of human flesh. So it's my conviction, it's our conviction that Psalm 139 really does leave no theological doubt that there's purpose, intentionality, design, beauty, uh, and real life and soul with uh, um, whose life, the scripture says, has already been marked out by God. The days of that life already marked out by God already counted, already marked out. What does that mean? Our God is deeply and intimately involved in the creation of every human life. Deeply and intimately involved. So, if you embrace the authority of Scripture, there is far more to personhood than physiological development, intellectual capacity, social skills, and this is why many Christians are actively and fiercely pro 
life. But, as you well know, and I've pointed this out, they're fiercely um, opposed. Fiercely opposed. There's another P here, and that is really a political clash. So you have personhood, which is where all of these convictions of someone who cherishes the sanctity of life, but then there's another P, which is a political clash. There's two main priorities that are in conflict. In other words, there's another side that says there's something more important than the sanctity of life. And you see these two sides fighting. You have the right to life that's fighting or being opposed by someone who believes the right to choose what one does with their own body is more urgent, a woman's rights, a woman's right to choose. And you could see that emerge politically. And then the right to life is also opposed by some who say now there's a need to prevent or reduce unwanted children. And that's one of the uh, uh, one of the ways in which the, the, pol- the politics start to clash. So these, these, this clash has to, do with, um, has to do with which of those rights is more urgent and more premium, which one is more exclusive to the other, the right for this life, this, the sanctity of life to emerge, or the right for someone to, to do what they want with their own body. So obviously this isn't a political thing, so we're not going to kind of dive into the political Uh, sides, but I just wanted to point out that this clash, as you know, is intense. And it has distorted, in my mind, it's distorted what is most precious to our our view morally, which is personhood. So here's some ABCs on abortion. Let me leave this with you as a means of trying to sort out. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? And, And what does our pastor here, me, what, what, what are my convictions related to abortion? Let me give you some A, B, could it be simpler than ABC? Don't say one, two, three. It's the same. ABC, simple. Check this out. Adoption, not abortion. Ab- adoption, not abortion. Now, this is a very short, simple statement. This is not a very short and simple process, right? This is not the quick fix solution, but uh, Sandy gave, uh, um, Kathy gave three, Kathy gave three specific choices that someone has to make, parenting, abortion, and adoption. And uh, apart from parenting, we know that adoption is a viable, especially right here in town with New Hope alive and well, rel- ready to love, support, care from beginning to end, anyone who finds themselves in a crisis. And so we would advocate for adoption. Uh, women with crisis pregnancy urgently need us to kind of come alongside of them, not to throw stones, not to um, really protest them and their situation, but to help them, help them find hope. I love that word hope, right? Because it's a hopeless situation, it feels like, for many. And also to find healing. And we support New Hope Adoption Services as one of the very practical ways that solutions are being offered through adoption. And uh, we're very alert to the way that a lot of people say abortion adds to the pain and suffering. Abortion adds to the crisis. Uh, And and you might not, this is fascinating to me, but did you know that crisis pregnancy centers outnumber abortion clinics 10 to 1? Did you know that? Uh, 10 to 1. Did you know that, Kathy? 10 to 1. Of course, my statistics are from 1947, but I just wanted to mention that. Not really. These are up-to-date statistics. Listen, try to get that through your mind. Services like this outnumber abortion clinics 10 to 1. 96% of women who are in a crisis pregnancy recognize the abortion clinic services of Planned Parenthood. 96%. Only 20% of those same women were aware of any um, adoption or, 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 or um, um, crisis pregnancy centers that, that were separate from or distinct from Planned Parenthood, right? So in some ways, you can imagine that someone who is suffering with a crisis really does only believe there's one single destination and solution for, for taking care of that problem. And in some cases, we see here that adoption is really an awareness problem not necessarily a, a person who's just dead set on making a termination decision. So I think that's fascinating for us to recognize that 20% recognize any real local pregnancy center. 
So help is out there, but women in crisis um, have trouble finding it a lot of times. So the next one is B, and, and, and it's really this phrase here, be pro-life. And then I want you to pay special attention to the plus. Be pro-life plus. Be pro-life plus. Not just anti-abortion. Not, how many of you, I mean, this is kind of a sobering question and answer, but how many of you feel like you kind of grew up in a church community where you were very, very clear on what you were against, but you weren't quite sure what you were for? Anybody? Like, I know what we're against, everything. I don't really know what we're for, right? So when we're thinking about the sanctity of life, here's what I'm hoping, that more than being anti-abortion, that we as a church family would be pro-life Plus, and the reason why I say plus is because it's important for us not just to say it, but to be it. It's important for us not just to hold this conviction. It's urgent. It's life and death urgent that you and I live this conviction. It's one thing to say you're pro-life. It's another thing to be pro-life. It's another thing to be pro-life plus going beyond the typical definition of being anti-abortion, not just uh, um, pro-life in our politics, but pro-life in our practice, where we spend our money, where we spend our time, who we care for, who we invest in, who we're alert to and alarmed by when they need care. If we're only pro-life in our politics but not in our practice, I would submit to you we're not really pro-life. We're pro-policy. Pro-life plus means we're, we're pro-life by lifestyle, by conviction, by our time, effort, energy, resources. We can say that we're pro-life. We can even vote that we're pro-life, but that alone doesn't mean anything. It doesn't solve anything. It doesn't help anything. And statistics actually tell us it may not even fix anything, change anything. So, so vital for us if we want to help and solve. And if we, listen, if we say we cherish life, then we would do something to help to actually support that life, not just uh, protest. So pro-life is powerful. It represents more than being anti-abortion. In the word life, there's so much, so much need, so much crisis. And we want to make sure we're paying attention to this word life, not just protesting the policies and um, getting involved to care for people. So how do we move from conviction to action? How do we do that? What does it look like to be truly pro-life? Well, um, one way is um, to be very plus. And what does plus mean? Well, there are three tunnels in the approach to um, pro-life, and the three tunnels tend to be this. It tends to be election, elect pro-life legislation and legislators and appoint the right judges. Then there's activism, right, in violent or nonviolent interruption of status quo. And then there's compassion, and it helps women who are surprised by a pregnancy. Those are the three tunnels. And the one tunnel I wanted to kind of emphasize here is compassion. So we've got adoption, be pro-life plus, and also compassion in crisis, not condemnation. If you're familiar with Jesus, one of the most incredible stories is when legalists drag a woman to him who was caught in adultery. She broke the law. And they're trying to trap Jesus by saying, what should we do? The law says we do this. Are you bigger than the law? Are you more important than God? Is your authority going to override the law that was given by the creator of the universe? And Jesus deals with unbelievable compassion. He deals with this crisis. His words are compassionate. His... Um, uh, um, his attitude is compassionate. His tone is tender-hearted, And he gives us the model of what compassion looks like. And it takes action to actually help the woman and the baby when there's a crisis, pregnancy. And it's urgent for us not just to address the pregnancy or the health issues, but to help the women who are experiencing some level of trauma, this trauma phase of their life where they feel like they've got a problem, the problem needs to be solved, and in our disposable culture, it's a disposable problem. But compassion would say, we're going to get involved and we're going to help intervene, we're going to help solve the problem, and we're going to see this problem as more of a life to be cared for and spared than a problem to be solved. It's not a disposable problem. So that means compassionately we get involved and 
discover? Is there abuse in the relationship? Is there homelessness? Is somebody absolutely petrified and and so trapped that they feel like the only way I'm going to have somewhere to live is if I terminate this pregnancy because I don't know what it's going to look like to pay for raising a child or where I'm going to live. Compassion says, I'm going to help you walk through this. I'm going to be a part of the solution. Compassion says, if you're trapped, I'm going to help support you to find a way out. I know good people like Kathy and her staff, and I'm going to connect you to them. I'm going to help you find a way out. Even if you truly think you can't find a way out, that there's only one solution. Compassion says, I'm going to help you find the resources to cover that. And then if there's secrets and shame, gospel people come in and say, hey, good news, all the secrets and all the shame that's, that's sinking into your life has been taken upon himself by Jesus. He has absorbed our shame. He's absorbed our punishment. You can get out from underneath that shame and experience new life and forgiveness and transformation and new joy that you never thought you could have. And it comes through saving faith in Jesus to emerge out of hiding secrets and staying silent and alone. And tragically, we know some some are victims of rape and often feel unjustified, loaded with all kinds of guilt and shame. But compassion says, I'm going to help intervene right there in those terrifying places. As everything we're called to do as disciples of Jesus, we really do look to him alone as our example. When he was um, receiving that woman caught in adultery, he didn't focus on her sin. He didn't focus on her behavior. He focused on restoration. He focused on healing. And then Uh, He also focused, uh, specifically, he focused on those who were doing the accusing, the protesting, and the the would-be rock-throwing. And once he was done with those people, then he worked um, deeply compassionate with her. And he gives us the picture of what it looks like to deal with people who are suffering trauma. Accused, trapped, uh, potentially abused, and so on. And he allows us to express the compassion and grace that brings God alive right in the middle of a life who has a God-designed life in their own body. And we get to demonstrate that together. And that's our unique calling as a body of believers. When you belong to God, here's what you say. You say, I am going to be a caregiver, not just a care receiver. And the care I give is going to be different from the world's care or people who are without God. We're going to care uniquely. We're going to care in a way that catches people's eyes, captures their hearts, certainly draws their attention to the idea that God is a caring God who by his own glory and our good is involved in bringing healing and hope. The church can be strengthened by our care. The world certainly could be uh, um, captured by the winsome witness of the church if we care this way. Listen, if you have or someone you know has suffered a traumatic crisis pregnancy and you're carrying the weight or you are even carrying the weight of someone that you love, you're carrying their hurt, their shame, their, their, um, um, all, all of the anguish that goes along this, I want you to know something. We here in our church family love you. We have Kathy here today to extend that love to you in a practical way and... Um, You have found a church family that isn't going to condemn you. Instead, is going to be overflowing with compassion. Why? Because we have new hearts filled with the compassion of Jesus, and it just overflows. And we want you to know that you're among a church family that um, deeply desires to bring hope and healing to you as much as you're willing to allow it. We're going to tell you how to do that here in, in just a minute. Would you pray with me, Father? Today I'm mindful of all of those eyes and ears who are looking in and listening in who are suffering or who have suffered. Maybe who have um, suffered in one way, shape, or form in the past and they just somehow uh, beyond explanation are here with us today. And I pray that these loving, compassionate words come alive in their heart. We pray that you give us wisdom on how to get help to them, that you give them the courage they need to get help to take the next steps of help that are available to them. We pray that you do something special in our heart to help us be a church family who um, embraces the sanctity of life 
and help us to discern between getting involved politically and getting involved morally and theologically. We cherish you and we cherish the life that you've given us. And we pray this in Jesus' strong name, our rescuer. Amen. Would you stand up?